but I'm Vanessa Dewey or V Dewey, as you see in my recording. Um, I'm here today to speak with John Couch or John S. John S. Couch about creativity. Um, before diving in, um, a little bit about, I would love to just tell you a little bit about myself for context and then hand it over to John so he can say a little bit about himself and then we'll dive into some nice conversation. Um, I have been a part of the original Brave team and prior to that, I, for about 10 years plus, I worked in corporate America from iconic brands like Mattel and Adobe. And since the beginning of this year, I've been on sabbatical, delving into more creative projects and explore and connecting with wider communities. Um, I've had the pleasure of having an di ongoing dialogue with John for almost five years now. It seems like it, um, it been a great point of inspiration over these last few years. I'm just thrilled to be able to have a, actually have some type of dialogue beyond just a Zoom call catch up, but for, you know, more of an in immersive experience with other people. So, um, John, would would love to have you shed a little bit of light on what about you, because you have such an amazing career. Oh. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm John S. Couch, and um, I have a book called The Art of Creative Rebellion, in which I, I wrote it about two I, about two years ago after I gave a speech at um, a conference called South by Southwest in Austin, Texas, and um, I was at this conference speaking about a new design that we had launched for. Um, Hulu. Hulu is a video streaming service in the United States. And it became, um, it, it was kind of based upon feedback from Reddit that we had gotten. And at the time it was, you know, the Reddit title was I Hate Your Effing Design. And we thought, oh, that's a great inspirational title in which to, to base a, you know, a conversation. So I was um, actually moderating myself along with the uh, des lead designer from Twitter and also Instagram about this. And then afterwards, I was asked, you know, about what kind of book could I read or what could I, you know, what books would you recommend for me to read um, about how to survive as a creative person within, you know, both a corporate environment or a startup environment. And then I realized there wasn't a whole lot of books that I could really recommend. And my wife said, why don't you write the book that you wish you had had when you were starting out? And then ultimately what happened is I wrote the book that I I wish I had had when I was a young designer. But I also wrote a book that um, I w I'm reading now, you know, that people have been reading now who are actually seasoned executives. Because it started out kind of as um, letters to a young poet for designers, and it turned out to be kitchen confidential for, you know, design executives as well as just executives in general. So I was, I was writing this book also because I got to a point in my career where I was at Hulu and I started in 2016 uh, with a redesign of the entire company, and the entire platform across mobile, web, and living room devices. And as I was building a team, because I had four designers at the time, and then I ended up hiring 40 designers within a nine month period in order to ramp up the change in the company, I realized that there wasn't a lot of, I had to kind of lay down culture very quickly and lay down the idea of what principles and tenets were for people to, to, to work with them. And so, again, the book kind of came out of the natural note taking that I did during the period of actually building the new experience for Hulu in 2016, launching in 2017. And in 2017, we were lucky enough to launch the new experience with a show called The Handmaid's Tale. And The Handmaid's Tale uh, was a huge uh, success, you know, for Hulu, and I guess you've seen it probably in the UK as well, uh, separately outside of Hulu. So anyway, is a long story, long. Uh, I originally started, ultimately, my career was at Wired Magazine back in the early days, and it was at that time at Wired that I came across really amazingly creative people who were really pushing the frontiers of, of uh, technology and culture. And, you know, at the time in, at Wired in the mid 90s, literally I would see people like The Edge from U2 walking down the hallway with Brian Eno. And you know, I'd be starstruck as they were walking by, but this was a very common kind of environment for both technology and, and creative types to, to, to kind of meander around. And so I learned about culture and creative culture probably mostly from being at Wired in its heyday and then decided to kind of bring that forward into my my career as I went on. So I think I'll stop there, V, because I'll just kind of meander as usual if I'm not careful. 
So you're on mute. Hi. You're on mute. Yeah, I should keep it on. Um, I was afraid my dog was going to say voice himself, but I've always been amazed by your career, just how you've traversed and as a polymath, just how you've been able to go beyond your daily life or your daily career of the nine to five. I'd love to go back to your book, The Art of Crave Rebellion, because I think what we're all here, we're in a certain situation, as you and I talked about what 2020 has been. And I feel almost Art of Crave Rebellion is almost to me a serendipitous that it was published this year alone. Um, you know, even in your first chapter, you have a quote from you know, 1984. But the one thing that stood out to me within the book was even just the first few pages was the quote that says, the world needs creative thinkers more than ever. And I feel it's very timely now because we are going through, not just as a recession, we're, going, we're coming into more systemic changes, massive changes that really the status quo thinking really won't you know, won't help us moving forward. And it is actually creativity. Um, and I almost feel like that quote is like a call to action. Um, would love to like delve into this more and get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I was, um, I call it the, the art of creative rebellion because I, I truly believe that we're in a time where people are not, you know, it's a very anti-intellectual environment that we're in, very anti-science kind of environment that we're in. Um, and I think it's really important that we have creative thinkers because creative thinkers question what is. They question the existing social mores, that this, the, they question how business is done. And I think with this unfortunate pandemic, the one thing it's been useful for is resetting to a large extent, the way that we, we do everything from the way that we interact with our families to the ways that we do business. And I think the power of design is that it can it can allow you to pre-visualize a future that does not exist yet. So by its very definition, design, when you do prototyping, you are literally envisioning a solution to a problem and then making it in a prototype format. And I think that the power that we have as creative thinkers is that there's such a negative narrative out there in the world right now that if we can actually counteract that negative narrative with a positive narrative, and that positive narrative doesn't have, can't be woo woo, you know, kind of fantasy. It can actually be shown demonstrably, you know, through prototyping and also also storytelling. One of the uh, most powerful things I think that I was able to do when I started my last my current job is that I realized that no one really knew where we were going from a product design perspective, and so I commissioned a short film to literally show human beings using the product in the future. And then once we did that, everybody aligned and said, oh yes, we want to make that. We don't want to, you know, once you were very clear about the what that you're trying to make, then you can figure out the how. And so I think creative thinkers are extremely important right now because you're going to be able to figure out what the what is to set the vision. And then we can work backwards from that, almost like a roadmap of how to attain that. But if we don't have a strong, clear vision of where we're going, and if we don't question the existing, you know, social structure that we're in right now and the political environment that we're in and the way that we do business, we're going to be, you know, in a lot of trouble. And so I think what's interesting about the last big crisis that there was, was in 2007 and 2008, there was um, the economic collapse that happened, obviously affected the whole world. But out of that incredible, painful crucible of pressure came the rise of Uber and Airbnb and Pinterest and Square and all these different companies came out of that period. And I, I do believe after this you know, year, probably over a year that we're gonna have uh, with the uh, you know, quarantine, especially in the United States, that there's gonna be a huge explosion of new ways of doing business, of new ways of living I think that the idea of being in an office, you know, the entire week will be an anomaly going forward. And I think that the wonderful thing about creative thinking is that you have the opportunity now, even though I, I know I personally spent about eight hours a day on, in front of Zoom, but I've, I've learned how to divvy up my day and my time. So I allow myself time to think creatively in a way that I couldn't think necessarily within the office. So anyway, I, again, I'm going to kind of ramble, but I do think that right now, 
that the power that everybody here has as designers is that you have the ability to pre-visualize where we can go. And you have the ability and the discipline and the experience to then figure out how to work towards that vision and communicate that vision more than ever. John, before we dive into the, before we go on to discuss further, I, I, I don't grow up spending 15 years in California. This, would you mind, um, mind uh, closing the door because yeah, I was wondering if you could hear the ocean creeping up and then hearing the hearing that's making me a little bit envious missing some of the waves from 15 years of being California. So. <laughs> Sorry, I, I was mentioning that I, I'm on vacation right now and I'm up in um, at San Luis Obispo, at Pismo Beach, and I was just showing the team earlier the, I hate to say, beautiful waves and ocean that we have out here. But uh, uh, sorry about that. Oh God, no worries. Uh, at first, it's fine. Um, but you were just you were just mentioning how you know we with creativity we'll be able to. There's so much opportunity right now. Like we can pre-visualize what's to come, and just makes me think about if we take a step back and if you were actually envisioning yourself as a student going into this, you know, starting your new fall term, you know, what advice or guidance would you give your student self at this moment? Well, you know, I, I did touch on this a little bit in the book, but one of the things that I, I realized um, that I had, let me, let me back up. Can you hear me all right, first of all? Okay. So <clears throat> I had this theory that the things that you love to do now, you love doing when you were about six or seven years old, and they haven't really changed. And then I think what happens is that we, we grow up and we systematically, through both the educational system and family pressure and social pressure, we tend to then discard the very things that we love doing, whether it's poetry or dancing or, you know, whatever the thing is that you end up, you love doing as a child, you probably still love doing now. And then as we go through the schooling system and we, we finally go to university, we graduate, we go straight into um, the, you know, the work environment. And I have found, at least that happened for myself, that by around the age of 28, you start to give up on your rock band aspirations. You kind of give up on the things that you, you're, you thought that you were going to try to do. And, <clears throat> and then what happens is that you end up getting into a proper job you're in your 30s, you didn't end up having a relationship, you may have children, and then this leads to the classic midlife crisis around you know, your 40s, where you're questioning what it is you're doing. And so the one thing I would definitely tell young people, especially when they're, when they're going through, through uh, their schooling system is don't give up on those dreams that you have while you're doing a job. And I talk about this in terms of like doing something beyond the day job. And I encourage this with my design team. I literally say, you know, please stop designing. Go make ceramics, go garden, go do anything that is not on the screen. You know, and what happens is that we get trained as creative people that if we're making something that's a product, it has to make money. If you're creating, it has to have some sort of financial benefit where it's really, you kind of get told that this is childish you shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't be drawing, you shouldn't be playing the piano. It'll, it'll never amount to anything, why are you doing this? And it's a really strange tendency for society and even our friends to kind of tear us down, you know, with microaggressions um, about like, you know, be serious, stop doing that. And if you're gonna do something creative, do it for money. And I think there's something really amazing about the way children create is that they're doing it in the moment. They're doing it with complete commitment to drawing a dragon when they're drawing or drawing, you know, a, a landscape without thinking about how am I going to sell this thing? And then what happens is we become adults is that we start to draw metaphorically with the end thought of like, how am I, how am I going to sell this thing? Which is fine. We have to do that. But what I would, again, going back to your initial question, I would advise young people to keep a journal, keep a notebook, and it can just be yours and it can be be a mess, but just keep writing down every single thought that comes across your mind. It's amazing. Even now, um, you know, I keep a notebook constantly and it's full of drawings and it's full of, you know, nonsense, really. But it's this kind of catcher of ideas that we start, we start to lose as we get older. 
And then what I found though is that when I write books or when I write, when I write essays, I always go to my paper first. And then I have a first draft, so to speak, that's actually been written down and then I can then refine it as I go into, you know, the, uh, into the computer. But what's amazing too, is I have, I don't know, hundreds of these notebooks. And what's amazing about it is that I've found that I've repeated myself exponentially. There's things I wrote 10 years ago that I'm writing now, which is kind of disheartening, but it also means I haven't addressed that issue. I haven't actually like expressed that problem. And so, I, I would highly encourage that if you love, love to play guitar, do not stop playing guitar just because you're working in an office. And I, I talk about this in the book a lot, but you are not your job. You are not your job description. You're not your job title. And I think the biggest mistake that people have is that they start to associate their self-worth with the hierarchy of what their title is within an organization because you are always bigger than the organization for which you work as a human being. And so, you know, I, I get told, oh, you know, I'm a vice president, it's not a big deal within, you know, the entertainment world. I'm like, eh, maybe, you know, I don't know. It's not that interesting to me. What, what interests me in the way I built my team is more building a community of people that I like working with because I became very aware that I'm spending time, you know, when we're in the physical office, eight to 10 hours a day that I'm spending with other human beings that I don't get back. I get paid every two weeks and that's great, but I'm spending time with other human beings that almost randomly that we came together. So I wanna make sure that the culture in which we are working together to make extraordinary experiences in which we're all engaged is more important because then ultimately that leads to the financial reward that everybody's chasing. You know, but the, but if you just simply are just dead set on making money, yeah, you'll make money, but you'll, it kind of perverts the creative spirit from which the thing was originally birthed. And so I want to make sure that in general, that when we're creating, that it's within the parameters of actually enjoying, enjoying what we're doing, which it's amazing how much joy is taken out of design when you're working in an agency and you're under deadline or how much joy is taken out. I, I work, you know, partly in Hollywood, you know, and, and I see, I know a lot of writers and I know a lot of directors and actors and how much joy is taken out of the initial reason that you became an actor, writer, or director because of the machinery of Hollywood, you know, which is bizarre to me because we all got into it because of this desire to, to create, you know, and then we found that, oh, I can make money from it. But you know, what happens again over time is that tends to switch. So long answer to your short question <laughs> i think don't stop doing the thing that you love doing even when you have a day job no i think that's great because even i remember i didn't go to art school right away because i have i got my bfa in graphic design but i initially for years thought oh like i grew up down the street from a major liberal arts college and it was during the 80s and i just like would see pic images of these students and I'm like, okay, I don't want to be a starving artist, but it took me a while to get there, but it makes sense because it's what I'm doing personally and professionally all intertwined now and makes sense, but it's like, it's there. Just realize that. And I totally agree with you there, um, John. But the one thing you're, as you're talking about this, I know we talked about this in the past, but it's the concept of, there's two things came out of your, what you just an, your answer. But one thing that comes to mind is like this concept of flow versus focus. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about your focus. Um, and I think even too, it's the one thing is when in our culture, and you touched upon this, we're in a mechanistic culture, we're cogs in the wheel in a way yeah. that is dictated by ROIs, KPIs, quarterly reports, or even making those grades, making sure we get those certain like level grades that we need. And that's dictates so much of our learning experiences, our professional experiences. Mm -hmm. But, and people are like, oh, I have to focus. But when you think of it, as we've discussed, focus really, when you try focus, it's not focus, it's counterproductive. And what we're talking, what we need to be focusing on more is the flow with yeah. and, and, you know, it's such a, that combination of focus versus flow is so key within creativity. And I'd love to, you know, explore this a little more and talk about, because I know we've, this has been like a thread through our conversations the last several years too. Yeah, no, it's, it's very interesting because I, I think the traditional idea of focus is that you have to like, have the furrowed brow and um, you know, you're focusing and, and it's like, I've got to 
focus and it's always a tense thing. And I, I noticed when I was in, in the corporate environment, we'd have these horrible fluorescent lit conference rooms with a whiteboard and we're gonna brainstorm now and really come up with nothing, nothing. It was, it's just death, you know, for creativity. Um, and um, one of the reasons why I, I tend to let people, I, I tend to focus creative process first on paper, literally on, on paper. Like I mean, everybody has to get a marker out and draw their ideas down because this actually loosens up the, the creative process. And part of the, the thing that I have found is that the more that I need to focus on something, the more I have to relax. I have to loosen up completely. It's the exact opposite of this constrictive kind of like I have to focus mentality. And in order to get into a state of that, you'll find, you know, as we've talked about that everybody's experienced their best ideas while they're in the shower or they're going for a walk or they're driving or something that is apropos of nothing to do with what you're supposed to be doing because your mind for a moment can go nonlinear. And the way that I have found at least my theory on this is that the best way to get to that state is through meditation. So, um, you know, I do a, a, a meditation every morning, which is, I use a app called Headspace. Um, just as a very quick way to, you know, get it in and, you know, I, just something very relaxing about Andy Puticombe's voice. And, and um, so I, I do that and it centers me in the morning and I get into a routine. So I'm up relatively early and I, I found that I need to have a routine in order to get anything done. So in order for me to get focus, even though I hate waking up early, I have forced myself to wake up early. And I sit down and meditate for about 20 minutes. And then at that point, I write. And I try to write every morning. And one of the, the techniques that I use in order to get into a state of focus, I borrowed from, borrowed from the writer Neil Gaiman, where he said that his one rule is when he goes into the backyard to write, you know, and he takes a, a fountain pen and paper that it's either he writes or he does nothing. Like no computer, no drawing, no social media. It's either you're sitting there and you're either writing or doing nothing. And then you're, if you do that long enough, eventually you're, you get bored enough to where you actually start to write because you just, you know, you can't not do anything. And so meditating, first of all, gets me into a centered state the center state allows for flow to happen at that point because the monkey mind can suddenly stop and you're able to then suddenly start to be one with the thing that you're making. And what I've found is that the, the ability to contemplate was strategically important for me, especially when I was a young person, because a lot of my reaction as a kid, not kid, I guess my early twenties was one of fear, you know, of like reacting to what is, and I, was, I realized I was in a constant state of regretting my past, all the mistakes I had made, and then fearing my future. And so my way of dealing with that was usually, you know, going to the pub or drinking too much or eating too much or even working out too much, you know, anything too much in order to like not feel present. That the moment I was in was incredibly painful. And so in order to deal with my anxiety, I would, you know, essentially, I guess self-medicate, you know, through food and bad habits. And then it was, and, and oftentimes when you're under stress, this is what happens, you know, and a lot of people tell me, well, John, I don't have a job. How, how, how can I even think about this? Well, ironically, it was when I was in the darkest point of my, you know, my early 20s where I had no idea what I was doing with my life, that I was able to find meditation, get centered, and for the first time, not react to things, not be tactical about the next thing, but think strategically. Because what creative flow and contemplation and centering allows you to do is to think longer term. And what it does is it destroys fear because being in a reactive state, it's all fear-based and it allows you to make decisions. It, you, it makes you make decisions which are emotionally reactive to the moment or your fear of the future versus actually being able to be centered and be here right now, which allows you to then think expansively about where you're going to be going and what your strategic thinking is at that point. So it was actually at my worst moment when I was in my early 20s when I decided to stop the nonsense and just sit and then count my breath because I trained in, you know, in, um, I was 
did martial arts when I was, when I was a kid and I had trained in, in meditation at that time. I just drew back on that. And by doing that, I was able to stop for a moment all the noise. And then I was able to think clearly for once about where I'm going. And I, and I realized that became a technique that I had to use later on in life in the corporate environment because most people are in a treadmill they get up in the morning they have the routine of like you know drinking tea or coffee going to work getting into the space and then basically sitting there and answering emails and then waiting for lunchtime to happen and then waiting doing emails again and then the day's gone and then they go oh what am i doing so they go out to eat dinner and drink maybe watch tv and then the day's over and then years go by and you feel like, what am I doing? I'm not actually getting the thing done that I need to get done. And then usually people have a radical change and they just stop everything, which I don't I, That's why I'm saying, I think in a lot of ways, practicing, you know, creativity in a, in a daily practice while you have a day job is very important because it releases that stress and allows you to connect to that thing versus going through the existential crisis later on of like, what am I doing? Right. And to your point, the, you know, there's this, you know, everybody probably seen the famous Sir Ken Robinson's TED speech, you know, when it came out um, 10 years ago, unfortunately he died, I guess about a month ago, but he, he talked about the education system destroying creativity and that we have moved from the industrial revolution into a mechanistic kind of approach to how humans are basically fulfilling a job role, like a cog in a machine. Mm -hmm. And then the, the thing that's dangerous about that, of course, is that as AI rises, as the, you know, as, as we have more and more white collar and blue collar jobs, which are going to be made redundant by technology, people need to develop their creative strengths even more because you're going to have the opportunity post AI, I believe, to think about the things that are truly important to you. Like what is meaning? What is purpose? You know, philosophy, art, you know, the higher aspirational parts of, of Maslow's, you know, hierarchy of needs you'll have a moment now to actually address that, you know, as human beings. And since so much of people's purpose is tied into their jobs, it's going to be an interesting transition over time to like move away from like the feeling that my job is who I am solely. Now your job is who you are to, to a large extent, but it's not completely who you are. So as you move from that into this post AI world in which you're going to have to then, you know, ideally be able to realize your higher self. It's going to be a really interesting transition. So anyway, as usual, I answered your question about five different ways, I think. So and, I hope as, as you, and there's so many different threads that could pull from that. Um, I think if one thing that just comes to mind, especially when you're talking towards, you know, towards the end and makes me think of um, in general, what's going on with our, the world as a whole, and you're, you know, focusing on that, you're mentioning about how our job is our, you know, who we are, we make that relationship to our job. And then even just how that plays into our education system and how, because the one thing that I've heard at least stateside is a lot of times employers are saying there's a disconnect from education and going into the real business world, like you pay $200,000 US dollars for your education, but you still have to learn more before you can actually get a job and be a applicable like there's some la lack of skill sets but in this time of reset like what would your call to action be for education at since you are actually in a role of hiring and seeing you know potential junior designers coming in and such like what would your call to action be to education in this time because this is where a major reset why not yeah i mean it's interesting we we, we do an internship program every year and uh, this was the first year that we did the internship program virtually which was interesting, but it still worked. It was really fascinating. But what's interesting about the education system, you know, that will do the internship program that we're doing is that you're essentially almost like having an apprenticeship, like the old school apprenticeship where you work with a, you know, a master printer, let's say if you're gonna be a printer. We don't really have that anymore in, within the education system as much as we used to. And so what's interesting is that not only are we doing internship programs, we're actually, you know, investigating the idea of even reaching into um, pre-university, pre-college students and then seeing if we can actually like help to train them, you know, and help to expose them. Because a lot of people who are in the university system, well, first of all, you've been filtered down to that. You, you, you were lucky enough to get into a university. 
but there's a lot of people who are social, socially and economically disadvantaged and just by being born in circumstance, they don't even know what product design is. They have no idea that there's even a way to make a living as a designer. And I think a huge um, interesting reset that we're going through is that as my designers and my design team have been speaking about, how do we as um, you know, professional designers then reach out to expose what we do to people who would never even know what an application design was, you know, to actually, and say, you can do this. You have the ability to do this. You don't, you don't have to keep doing the same thing your parents did, you know, or your family did. That you have the opportunity to do things that you normally would not even know, you know, are things that you, your family would even know were on the horizon. So, these are the kind of things that we're trying to do as, as we're reaching out. And, and, and I do think, you know, part of the problem, especially in the United States, I, I can't speak for, for you know, Europe, but or the UK, but there's definitely the idea of a business school, right? Like you go in and you, you are trained to become a business person, but the original idea of university, going back to um, the Greeks was an idea of literally learning many different things. And I wrote about this recently in an essay about the dilemma of the modern polymath that in a lot of ways, it's almost looked down upon if you can do many things well. But if you go back to even, I don't know, the Renaissance, it was assumed you could speak four or five languages. It was assumed that you would be conversant in, in philosophy and religion and science and art. And it would be kind of like the entirety of, of, of human knowledge is something that uh, a well-educated person would be knowing all the way through probably the early 20th century. And then <clears throat> what happened over time is we became more and more specialized. And then going to um, college, university became very much about specificity of getting a job in a certain way. And then the idea of uh, learning the liberal arts became completely devalued. And then when you look at the United States system, the majority of defunding that happens in the educational system, what's the first thing that they throw out? It's the arts and music, you know, like those useless things, which are the most probably fundamentally important things as human beings to, to have, are actually like pushed out the door. And what's important, you know, in the hierarchy of learning is math and science only. And those are important, but they shouldn't be the only things that you're focusing on. So again, this goes back to the idea that Creativity, whether it's dance, music, poetry, you know, or anything that's not utilitarian has less value now within the overall social perspective, you know, of how people think, you know, your value is within the society. And so, so the irony of the polymath situation, though, is that I, I can name two polymaths right now that you, you know, Oprah is a huge polymath, has multiple interests, multiple capabilities. She does many things. She's actress she's a she's a writer producer you know she has books mag she's an empire and then the other one would be like elon musk you know it has multiple interests and in, you know things he's working on at the same time so we in a weird way we celebrate those who make it you know those who are eccentric you know and it kind of goes back to the steve jobs you know campaign for apple and think different all those people that were in that campaign from gandhi to einstein to amelia Earhart to Isadora Duncan, not one of them would do well in a corporate environment. Guarantee you that if you hired any one of those people on that advertising campaign from, what is it, 20 years ago, <clears throat> that they would all fail miserably within a proper company environment. And yet we celebrate them, right? We celebrate Andy Warhol, but we would never hire Andy Warhol. <laughs> so it's, it's a very strange relationship we have, you know, with, with that. So. No, it, it is a, a, like the polymath definitely is something that's interesting has come up in conversations I've had recently, even with um, the architect Andy Jahar. But if anything, I think more, it's almost like a, a dead end for anybody's career. Like you hit, no one's going to give you keys anymore. But if anything, what's proving the situation right now we're in, John, it seems that a polymath, polymaths are going to be the way of the future in a way to help us out of the situation. Um, they bring in the critical thinking in um, to p governmental issues, to um, other things that you might not expect creativity to be infused in, but it has to be infused. And that, you know, by infusing the creativity, say, designing the future of London, per se, um, which Indy Jahar is doing with Sajid Khan, 
it almost also brings in a level of play, I find, that we need in our life. Um, and even you were mentioning about how you build up your teams before and create a community around that, but if almost something about play that by infusing play into community building and building into building relationships, bonding relationships, fostering tolerance and all, I feel like that's something that is intrinsic to creativity is play. But as we've been talking about, um, creativity is dropping, like arts are cut in academics. But I would love to explore more about play because I think we're at such a critical point because as you're highlighting in education, arts and are cut, um, businesses, it's all about focusing on one role. Um, it's all about the numbers. Um, and like, what does play mean to creativity? You know, and, you know, it's yeah. imperative. And I'm just curious, because we've ta touched upon this in the past, but even just listening and reflecting upon what you've said so far, I'm like, I wanted to pull this out. Yeah, it, it's, I think that we've become less playful as we get older. I mean, it's, it's just what happens. You know, when, if you, if you, if you see a seven year old child who is spinning around on the front lawn of their house, that's perfectly normal. If you see a 40 year old male do that, you call the police. So, you know, the, uh, there's just a, an in, intrinsic kind of distrust of play as not being serious, which is, it's not, you know, as you get older. But the, the, the funny thing about play is that through the process of play, and I think it's the reason why people love athletics is because it's literally playing you know, that, that you allow for serendipity to happen. You allow for happy accidents to happen in the process that you can't get to in a linear process. But we, we, we tend to avoid that. And I find that play is a really good way to deal with fear. So fear is basically triggered by the unknown, right? Like I don't know something and therefore I get terrified. And any change that goes on in our environment causes fear as well. And so there's two approaches to fear I found, you know, broadly speaking. One is to shut down, you know, reduce your field of vision and then just hang on to someone who can tell you what to do. You know, like whether that's a political figure, of, you know, like, please just, I'll do anything, just tell me what to do. Or it's religious or it's even an, an environment where authority suddenly becomes very powerful because people are looking for solutions and they want someone to tell them what to do. This is the antithesis of creativity, by the way. This is acquiescing one's will and creative, you know, capabilities and then shutting them down and saying, I'll just do what you say. Please just tell me what to do. The other op opposite of that is the creative mindset, which embraces the unknown, which embraces change. And rather than resisting change, actually looks at it as being opportunity. You know, so there, you know, there's the, I don't know, there's maybe, it's apocryphal, but there was there was a famous story about Thomas Edison, um, and I, I guess his giant Menlo Park and you know this the East Coast Menlo Park uh, buildings that he had with everything he'd been working on. And at this point, he was already quite well known and um, extremely successful. Was burning to the ground, and he uh, some chemical explosion had happened, and so. He asked his wife, you know, to come with him to come watch everything burn to the ground. And his, you know, and his all of his family and friends are freaking out and saying, like, oh my God, you're losing everything. You know, the great Thomas Edison's losing everything. And he goes, No, he goes, take a look at this. You, you rarely get a chance to see a flames this big, you know, and a fire this enormous. And he's talking about his own everything that's he had been building for decades, going up in flames. You know, he was a little bit psychotic, I think, but he was basically saying, look at the beauty of this, this fire. And he goes, and don't worry, we'll build it all again. So what's interesting, I thought whether it's true or not, and it, by the way, within 18 months of that fire, he was actually up and running and making twice the amount of money he was making before. The, the thing that's interesting about it is that from a mindset perspective, most people would have looked at that and said, I'm lost. I've lost everything, I'm crushed, I'm destroyed. You know, and this is where the creative mindset's really important because it goes from being from one of like condemning what's happening to radically accepting what's happening or what has happened and then figuring out immediately how to creatively problem solve. And, and that's the time that we're in right now. We're looking for fast solutions from people in positions of authority and just blindly accepting them. But what we should be doing is creatively rebelling and, and, and not to be anti whatever it is, but to be even more expansive 
and as creative people and think even beyond it, expand your, your, your perspective and your vision and then figure out a way to creatively uh, solve that problem. Because one thing I do tell my team is that you, creativity at its foundation is problem solving. So look at any huge, what seems like completely apocalyptic situation and go, how can I solve the problem? What opportunity is there within this that we can address? It reframes everything. So it's like, you know, Edison looking at the destruction of his entire career in business, he reframed it and said, oh, look, he told his wife, you'll never see flames as big again, check it out. And number two, great, we'll start from, we'll start from scratch again and we'll redo this whole thing. We have an opportunity to like really change how we're doing things. And I think that's, you know, again, maybe mythological, but it's also a really fascinating way to kind of reframe a problem. Is. I never knew that story because growing up on the East Coast, I, you know, I spent time in Menlo Park, East Coast, and and all, but never knew that story. But it's it takes moxie, it takes guts to do that, and you see a lot of leadership in this time. You're still hearing how many times have we heard in the last six, seven months? Oh, when we go back to normal or the new normal, like there's no normal right now. It's after COVID, AC, but mm -hmm. it's this fear. I find like it's with leadership right now. They're not stepping up, and they're just still doing the quick fix. Um, you know, I'm just thinking what, I know I'm going off my, some of the questions I, or points I was talking or sent to you, but the one thing that comes to mind is like, how can we embrace creativity? How can we make these changes? But it's like when our leadership is falling through, is it through building up, like interde being more interdependent, being in collaboration, forming alliances or like more groups and connecting than just having, you know, somebody at the head or, you know, somebody dictating what's being done to the education system or what's being, how, Adobe or some other companies are going to move forward instead mm -hmm. of so what are you you know what do you think about that like with how we, we can actually embrace this change and embrace fear together well it's you know it's interesting when I started my team out I was um, very much of the mindset of um, you know engaging in radical candor you know like the book you know and being very flat and what I found is that when you're doing a a startup environment where everybody, all hands on deck, that works very well because everybody has to do many things. As the team is maturing, and as my team is maturing, I realize even though I hate to do it, there's a certain amount of structure I have to put into it. You know, I, I, I'm loath to call it hierarchy, but there's definitely like a structure of like decision-making that has to happen. And the, the role for me um, as the leader of my team is, is not to tell them what to do, it's actually to unblock them to unblock the path for them. So it's, it's not like I'm, I'm sitting there saying, you know, you must go do this and this. We have a dialogue, we have a discussion, and then, but the ultimate responsibility has to come down to one person making a decision. Because if you don't, you end up having the classic design by committee, and then you end up with medio mediocre work because no one wants to stick their neck out. The, the role of the, of the leader in any group should be one of defending their team, but also taking full responsibility for the consequences of what their team does and I think a lot of people in general well, look let's just be very clear any group dynamic of any company is all fear-based on some level there's uh, it all has to do with survival the reason why we as social animals are very concerned about how other people think about us is that at the very core DNA of a reptilian brain is the fear of obsolescence or being banished from the group and so you see this in corporate environments where people are afraid of speaking their truth to power. They're afraid of speaking openly to anybody around them because it's a ceremony, it's a dance. And then you are trying to position yourself by saying the right thing at the right time in the right context that hopefully will then put you into the right light that'll then further your ascension within the group, right? And then, but the problem with creative people is that what they often say are the things that people don't want to hear. That the things that, and, and this is where the innovative dilemma comes in, is that the thing that made the company powerful initially, when they went from startup to established company, was this completely rebellious, radically new idea. And then what happens is that it, it gets launched and then it becomes optimized, this product, and it becomes, in, it, it, it never innovates, never, never changes. Because all you're doing now is increasing KPIs, your key performance indicators, and you're making it faster, smoother, but you're not really changing anything. And the, the extraordinary thing, you know, of the example of the iPhone, 
as I remember when it first came out, everybody was attached to their Blackberries with their QWERTY keyboard, you know, QWERTY keyboards on their phones. And the idea of having a screen that is completely flat, you know, that's glass was radical. I mean, we were all considering it normal now, but at the time, it was a radical idea. And, and Microsoft, Steve Ballmer said it, it was, you know, complete joke. But what's interesting is that that telephone, you know, that design uh, that Apple came up with did not come out of like user testing. It did not come out of like going out and saying, what do you want? Because people would say, I want a better keyboarded phone. And it's kind of like Steve Jobs quoting, you know, Henry Ford, who said, if you ask people what they want, they want a faster horse, not a car. And you at times have to balance out the data that you're getting, the research that you're getting, which is what everybody's afraid of like not using because that's, you know, I can, I can quantifiably show you how people behave but then sometimes they don't know what they want and you have to then build something that they may not realize that they actually want or need, you know, and a combination of the two is really important. And then if you ever read Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink, from years ago, he talked about the ability that people who are experienced in creativity have the ability called thin slicing. They can see something and know, boom, that's correct or not correct. And, and it, people call it intuition, but actually, it's an accretion of experience over time that is built up into this, you know, mastery, so to speak. And that coupled with data and research, that's a lethal combination in a good way. You know, that, that two sides, the yin yang of hard empirical evidence coupled with creative leadership makes something extraordinary. But to your question about, um, you know, the dynamics of the environment. The problem is that you have to overcome fear constantly, constantly. And I, I tell my design team in general that I expect them to work with me for maybe three years, you know, and then I don't think you're going to stay with me for much longer than that. And then by the way, as a creative person, you should always be prepared to get fired, quit or leave. And you should have like at least two months of salary put away so that psychologically, you're doing things for the right reasons. You're not doing it to please your boss. You're doing it for the, you know, without fear of losing your job, you're doing it because you're doing, you're trying to present the right solution for the user or the customer. And you're doing it from an ethical principle perspective. And then I think so many bad decisions are made, you know, because as an example, there's, um, if your KPI and numbers are driven, there's, there's a, a bank in the United States called Wells Fargo. And a couple of years ago, they got into a lot of trouble because they had had this mandate of opening up as many accounts as possible because they were KPI driven, which is like just open a number of accounts over and over and over. And of course, it's completely unethical and people who were, couldn't afford it had multiple accounts being opened for them. Of course, it ended up backfiring on them. But the point being is that without conscience, you know, without an oversight and you're, you're just driven by numbers and you're not taking humanity into perspective, it can be a really, really dangerous thing for a company. So ironically, the company needs creative rebellion within it. The problem is that most companies are really unsure how to manage creative rebellious people within their company. They look at them as being problematic. But in reality, what you need to do, the way that I manage creative rebellious people is I don't manage them. I don't tell them what to do. I give them challenges and I say, here's problems that we have to address and allow them to, to actually come up with the answers and then come back. And my job as editor, you know, to then try to then edit it down to something that actually would make sense for the company. Now that makes, I think the creative rebellion, I think that transcends almost everything in society right now, what needs to be done, even seeing what, you know, what's going on over in the UK with what happened with the A levels and all earlier. Um, we are at time, but before we leave, we, we have time for like one question if anybody has a question. Um, Helena, do we have time for a question if that anybody wants yeah, to? Or? I think I think one, one question or so. It's just been so interesting. Yeah, uh, if anyone has a question out there, there's been lots of stuff coming through the chat, lots of response to what you're saying, John, which has been okay. really, really interesting. Uh, I don't know if anyone out there has a, a question for John. Yeah, I hate being put on the spot too. I, I, these group environments where you have to ask a question are always so awkward. <laughs> so <laughs> I totally understand. 
Um, maybe V, we can just take a, a um, question from the chat. Can you yeah. do that? If there's anything that uh, had crept up in there. Um, what, what did you just Hi, I do have a question. Oh, sure. Perfect. Hi there. Um, Hi. It's been really interesting listening to you. I'm a primary school teacher mm -hmm. and I wondered what I see creative rebellion in my classroom all the time and I love it. I think it's, um, you know, it's children that are often, you know, I'm often told, oh, this child's going to be quite difficult or they're going to be a bit of a challenge. Um, what advice would you give to teachers when you think you come across creative rebellion in your classroom? Well, um, you know, it's, it's interesting because I think um, my, my interaction with my teachers growing up is very similar to my interactions with my boss now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tend to be the, the disruptive kid in the room. Um, and, and so I have great empathy for what it's like to have to deal with someone like me. Um, but I, I think a lot of kids that are having rebellion, rebellion, so to speak, is because they're bucking against the existing armature of how they're being taught. And, you know, there's this very templatization, not, not saying you're doing that, Emma, but I'm saying in general, schools have a very templated way of like, here's how you do things. And here's, here's the syllabus and here's what we're going to address. And if the child is not being engaged by that, we say, well, it's the child's fault. Um, my dad's a professor, university professor, and every year he would have the same course that he would be teaching. And I, I always thought it was really strange because you have a new group of people, but here's the thing that you have to learn and that's it. And I, I think what's, what is going to be more important is that we've become much more of a bespoke educational system per person in the same way that we become more bespoke about jobs. But one, of, one of the things that um, as a parallel, Emma, and this may not be exactly, you know, tying into what you're saying, but when I hire someone for a job, I use the job description as kind of a flycatcher just to get the right people in. But then I assume that they can do the job that I'm asking them to do, but then I try to almost like a Venn diagram on one circle. It's like, what are your actual personal interests? What do you want to be when you grow up? What are you, what is your life purpose? And then the other Venn diagram is what's, what's the business needs of the company and where those two intersect is where I try to find the sweet spot to then push them down because then they're engaged and their engagement then benefits the company and it also engages them and they learn. So, it's a little bit difficult because I actually have to learn about the special interests and needs of each person on my team. But once I've done that, I've moved them from being capable of doing one thing to being able to do multiple things. So I'm getting three X the, the ability and capabilities of the person um, because I've spent time actually finding out more about them and what their interests are. And so if I was teaching a class, I would probably spend more time not only with the child, but with the child's parents to find out where the child's interests lay and what they're doing. So for example, my daughter, um, you know, has, it, it was really bucking against the standardized testing that they do for entrance into college. But, but it's something that she had to take because the system requires that. Now recently, just this year, they're, they're shutting that down for California. That you don't have to have the standardized test to to enter into the university system. But up to that point, there, there was that. And so the way that she thinks and learns is very different than her friends or anybody else. But the system, again, was very much geared towards, this is how you think. And I was encouraging her, so don't worry. You know, what you're doing and the way you think is much like your dad. So you're gonna be fine. You know, we'll, we'll get you into the university and then you'll be doing things that don't require Required calculus, you know, like you know, if you want to do calculus, wonderful. But if you don't, that's fine too. So I guess I'm in a very my usual long-winded way. I think what's going to be interesting over time is to really sp pay special attention to each person individually, because I think what's happened in corporate environments is that they look at people as being the job title that they have, the the function they have within the organization, and that goes back to schooling, where again. You know, you're looked upon as being 
kind of this a child looked upon as being this empty vessel in which we are now pouring information into versus actually sitting down and saying, what are you interested in doing, V? Like little V, like what is it that your passions are? You know, and then working a curriculum around their interests as well. And I, I know it's a bit radical, but I think you, you need to give them the basic information about, you know, grammar and mathematics and what have you. But also if someone is fascinated by dance then help them do dance you know at the age of five or six and then the same thing i do with my team is i told them i um i gave a speech to these princeton design students a couple of years ago and i think i wrote about it in the book and i said the thing is you're gonna, you're brilliant and you're going to come out of university and you're going to have this much ability and i'm holding my hands out and then you're going to go apply to like apple or google or facebook or some giant company and they're going to hire you because you can do all this work and then they're going to say, and this is your job. And your job is going to be this one slot. And you're going to say, but I can do all this other stuff. And say, yep, we want you to do this one thing. Because that's how you function within the organization. And you have to decide how long you can do that before you decide to go work for another company, start your own company, or become a freelance creative designer. So anyway, again, I think I answered that sideways. But hopefully that helped. Thank you. I look forward to reading your book. Okay. Um, yeah, no, so how are you, Helena? Are we good on time right now? Or I think we... that might be just to, um, because there's a few things going on in the discovery tent um, at five o'clock. If you want to pop on over to there and ha have a look. Um, uh, but V and John, it's been a pleasure. I know you'll, you'll want to thank John yourself, V, but it's been an absolute pleasure, John, on behalf of me and all the team to, to have you here. I'm a, I'm a big fan. I'm a bit of a groupie. Uh, so <laughs> it's, been a, it's been a lovely yeah. moment to have you here. V, v over to you. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for everybody attending, especially on a Friday evening if you're over in the UK. And thank you, John, for taking time on your holiday in San Luis Obispo. Um, yes, of course. It's always nice to have time to have a conversation with you. I'm always walking away inspired and always the gear makes me think about it progresses to other thoughts. So um, I look forward to speaking again at our catch up. So wonderful. Well, thank you all. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. I hope um, it made sense. <laughs> and uh, and uh, yeah, wonderful, by the way, How, you know, wonderful festival you're having. I'm so impressed with it. Very exciting. And thank you for allowing me to be part of it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Bye. Bye.